Hey, I am Jason Reitman. I'm the co-writer and director of Ghostbusters Afterlife. And we're going to be looking at the trailer today. Maybe a new home can be an opportunity to start fresh. I just wish you'd get into some trouble. There's still time. Historically, Ghostbusters movies were always about people going into business. It was about people starting a Ghostbusting business together. And I, I suppose I knew immediately from the beginning that I wanted to make a movie about a family. This is a movie about the Spengler family. The Spengler family is disconnected. And this movie is about why. You're a great mom. I don't know. I'm fine with Trevor. But with Phoebe, she really keeps me on the outside. That's normal. You know, Gil Cannon and I immediately wanted to establish a new location for Ghostbusters. Obviously, the franchise is synonymous with New York City. But we wanted to go someplace new. We wanted to go to the American West. We wanted to go to farmland. We wanted a new color palette. We wanted to start a new idea. And this is a film that is about discovery. And it really is about a family retracing its roots. You know, we're immediately establishing Phoebe's character here as an outsider. And I think that's really important. I think, you know, these movies have always been about outsiders who discover themselves through ghost busting. Ghost busting has never attracted the people who are traditional heroes. They don't look or feel like superheroes. We wanted the movie to unfold like a mystery. Why is this family here? Who was their grandfather? Why did Egon come to this part of the country, to Somerville, Oklahoma? Why this house? What is under the floor? You know, we immediately recognize this piece of iconography from the 1984 Ghostbusters film. My connection with Ghostbusters always had to do with this ephemera. It was the packs, it was the traps, it was the car. A lot of this film for me was the thrill of what it would be like to discover all these things in your home. Oh, we studied all the original props, and we measured them, we lidar them, we tried to get them down to the screw, down to the rust. It was very important to me right from the beginning that we are really paying homage to the original film and trying to recreate it to the best of our ability using old techniques when necessary. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna point out that if you look at the top of the house, you see all these antennas and you know it was meant to kind of echo the top of Ecto-1. You know, throughout the film, you're gonna be finding all these kind of mirror images to the 84 film. Sometimes it's gonna be how the, f the actual shot is composed. Sometimes there's, you know, little references and Easter eggs just to kind of the, the, tr the props and the ephemera of the original film. This was a house that we actually built from scratch and we built twice. We built once on this location and then once uh, out on a soundstage. Your father wasn't much of a homemaker. He could hardly keep the power on. Now, Janine, there's nothing more thrilling than being reintroduced to the characters we love from the films that we grew up on. And it was really exciting to work with Annie Potts again on Janine. And as you can see, she is still the most stylish person in the universe. We get the sense that Janine is still connected to Egon Spengler. In the 84 film, she was in love with him. And clearly, she still has a connection to him and that she was, you know, attempting to take care of him in his older age. This was one of the first ideas that ever came to me was Ecto-1 wheat drifting, you know, and in my head, I had always thought of, uh, you know, snowboarding videos. And if there was a way to recreate that with a car in a field of wheat, it actually turned out to be a field of barley, you know, for the farm uh, aficionados out there. But we wanted to do as much practically on this film as possible. And I think it's really clear when you look at the shot, we rebuilt Ecto-1 from the ground up, put a Corvette engine in it and made it so that we could do all these things practically. So we spent a whole afternoon doing donuts with the Ecto-1 in the wheat field. And by the time it came back, you could actually smell the toasted barley coming out the front of the car. Paul Rudd plays a seismologist who comes to this small town because of these mysterious earthquakes and needs to find a job to pay the bills and ends up teaching summer school to a bunch of kids who really don't care. Except for Phoebe, he somehow finds the one student who's just as smart as he is. You see Phoebe watching this Ghostbusters commercial on YouTube, and it really gives you a sense of how little she knows about her family. The movie takes place in real time, and much like anything that happened in 1984, if you grew up a child of the 2000s, like my daughter, who is Phoebe's age, you really don't know that many things that happen in the 1980s. You know the major events, but one isolated event in New York City may not have found its way into your you know, chronology. 
you know, a teenager, this would be the way you found out about them. You'd go online. And just like many things these days, there would be people who believed and then there would be people who didn't believe and there'd be conspiracy theories. First, you have the shot of the dry ice coming out of the chimney. And this is just another example of how much we wanted to do things practically. I think these days, you know, they would just do that all CG. But we wanted to do practical effects as much as humanly possible. I mean, the, we would have conversations when we started this movie with anyone who was hired about whether they were a fan of the original and how it was made, its tone, its style, its color. We wanted this to feel like the original recipe. And that came down to old filmmaking technique being employed by people who just loved the craft of movies. The PK meter is one of the great pieces of technology in Ghostbusting. We associate it completely with Egon Spengler. It was his device. It's not just the way it looks and feels and moves. It's the sound of it. When you hear the PKE meter, it is different from any other sound. The same way that the proton pack, the trap opening up, the sounds of the ghosts. I really have to hand it to my father. When they made Ghostbusters, they made all these beautiful original choices that makes the film stand out years later. And it's not just how funny it was. It was the way the creatures looked, it's way the all the, the props operated and sounded. Yeah, I'll never forget where Gil and I were sitting when we came up with the mini puffs. We were talking about Stay Puffed and this iconic, enormous character that was echoed in some ways through the 89 and 2016 films. And we knew we didn't want to do that again. And we thought, how do we reinvent Stay Puffed? And then, what if he was tiny? <laughs> and we immediately identified these gremlin-like creatures who enjoyed watching the world burn, who were just like curious five-year-olds who wanted to break everything, who didn't feel pain, and as a result, could truly torture each other. And yes, at that point, it was impaling, it was burning, it was s'mores, any violent thing we could think of that we would want to do in a Walmart when we were five years old. Anyone who's a fan of the original film will recognize those pink streaks from 1984. We actually found the original special effects 70 millimeter footage and scanned it. So uh, again, we were always attempting to go back to the original recipe and recapture as much as humanly possible. You're also going to you're also going to see uh, a skeletal ghost in this section. That was a piece of puppetry as designed by Arian, obviously meant to echo the taxi ghost from the original. There's nothing like shooting with practical ghosts, with having something right there that the actors can work with. And, and for me, it's like putting on an old record. You know, it ties you back to a kind of filmmaking and a kind of watching movies that I grew up with. Again, if I think back to myself at seven years old, seeing the original film, which I saw many times, I saw it during prep. I watched, you know, screenings of it. I went to the premiere of it. The thing that scared me the most was the terror dog. I spent my entire childhood thinking there was a terror dog under my bed. And I loved the way it moved. Like anything that you see, I think Ghostbusters is kind of like the first scary film that a lot of people see because it's like this strangely safe horror film that you can watch as a child. And the terror dog becomes one of the great monsters you're introduced to as a kid. And I love the way it moved. Even that kind of that that silly bunny hop it does across the street uh, when they did the claymation uh, terror dog. When it flies through that door in uh, Tully's apartment and hits the wall uh, in New York, I, I could watch that clip over and over again. So one of the thrills of this film was bringing the terror dog back to life. Like, how could we get the terror dog to move now using our technology? And, and our terror dog is a mix of puppetry and beautiful CG. There's a spectral form of the terror dog as well in this trailer. You know, something about the original, when you try to kind of break down the way that terror dogs worked in the original film, there were gaps left in between the possessions and the moments in which you saw the mechanics of the terror dog mythology and we wanted to explore what spectral terror dogs looked like that was kind of one of the delightful things about the original is there's a moment where you know the coat gets thrown on its head and it has to shake it off like a dog and then when it and it bangs through the door in the original it literally has to kind of find its footing again that 
terror and goofiness mix is part of what makes it so good. So one of the things that we studied was the running of the bulls and the way those bulls will smash into storefronts and then find their footing again in the way that their hooves uh, lose traction on the bricks. Uh, this shot is also the tail end of a recreation of a shot from 84 of Ecto-1 flying out of the firehouse. You know, there's that great 180 it does um, that they had to under crank, you know, in a chaplain esque way back in 84. And we wanted to get the car going so fast that uh, it cooked on its own. Certainly, we wanted to think about, you know, what kind of technology was added to Ecto-1 in between 1984 and 2021. And the joy of that was really adopting the original style of technology and employing it on Ecto-1. We never wanted anything to look all platinum looking. You know, there's, I think, a tendency on on some science fiction films to make all the technology look as though it was, you know, poured in silver. And we wanted everything to have the original rusty, you know, everything in Ghostbusters sometimes looks like a cast iron pot, you know, it, you know, you always got the sense that the, the guys stole all this equipment from Columbia university and were constantly, you know, building their, their stuff with whatever they could find. So when it came to the gunner seat and the RTV, we wanted them to echo all those same lines from the original. Now, the, the point of them, of course, is to put ghost busting in motion. One thing, if you think about the original film, in fact, all three Ghostbusters films, Ghostbusting is done traditionally with four people standing side by side. We wanted to put ghostbusting in motion. We wanted ghostbusting, you know, going 65 miles an hour through a small town uh, where these kids were being put in danger the entire time. Let's talk about the RTV for one second. So one of the delights of putting ghostbusting into motion is that it really gives each character a unique task. Someone drives the car. Someone hangs out uh, the side on the gunner seat and, you know, throws the wand on the ghost and someone operates the RTV. What I loved about it is the way that it brought this group together. At the end of the day, ghostbusting has always been an opportunity for outsiders to be heroes, for uh, an, a group of unlikely people to come together and do something spectacular. The, the way that we bust ghosts in this film really brings these young people together uh, in a way that I think is thrilling. And it took us, this sequence that you're seeing a piece of here, took the entire film to shoot. If you had asked me earlier in my career if I was ever going to do a car chase, I would have probably said no. And in the end, I've done one that is so thrilling that I can't wait to do another one. Identifying the look and feel of Ghostbusters ghosts is actually really tricky. If you think about the ghosts that were in the original, and there's only a few in the original, right? You have Slimer, you have Stay Puft, you have the ghost that comes out of the subway, and you have the taxi driver ghost, and you have the librarian ghost. And they look completely different from each other. <laughs> what is it that connects Ghostbusters ghosts? What does it make them all of the same universe? And we spent, I can't even begin to tell you how many hours in long conversations over lunch, over dinner, trying to figure out what is it that makes a Ghostbusters ghost uh, a Ghostbusters ghost. It is out of these conversations that Muncher was born. We knew that he would be uh, the same free-floating class of Slimer. We knew that he would be kind of just as old and tissuey and angry. <laughs> Something happened to Slimer over the years and people started thinking of him as the D Dalmatian of the firehouse. You know, when the original Slimer was an angry dude and very scary, and we really wanted to get back to that. <laughs> Well, you know, first of all, obviously, you know, we see the red phone getting picked up at Raise a Cult Books. So for uh, any fans of the 89 film, uh, they will recognize one of my favorite locations from that film that we recreated down to the detail, down to the smell, frankly. You won't recognize this tattoo on the arm of Ray Stans. Dan Aykroyd and I had talked about the possibility of him having a tattoo and something that maybe recognized the acts of 1984. And immediately came to us that we would speak to this conversation that Winston and Stans have in Ecto-1, right at the height of uh, the 84 film. I've been pretty coy about the plot of this film from the very beginning. I have kept it like a very close secret to my heart. And part of that is because I feel like I'm 
not only carrying the Spengler story, but I'm carrying my own family story. And that it's been a long wait for me, as it has been for anyone who has anticipated the next Ghostbusters film. And I'm just thrilled to share it with everybody. And uh, it's a movie that was made by a family, about a family. And uh, my father and I cannot wait for you to see this in theaters. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out the trailer for Ghostbusters Afterlife again. And let us know what you think about it in the comments below. For everything else, subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.